I can't help but smile And sometimes I can't help but say Sometimes I can't help but smile
being saved. It's going to be a good takeoff point for this afternoon. And I want you to know that the church is the one and only place of God's salvation. It is the hospital where sick people get well. It is the ark of safety from the flood. It is the house of God, the pillar and ground of truth. It is rock established, spirit sanctified, Christ owned, God directed, and heaven bound on its way to glory. And having said all of those positive things about the church, I know that there are times, and there are times when the church runs down on energy. There are times when the church becomes somewhat lethargic. There are some times, quite frankly, when the church runs into a funk. I can say funk around here, can't you? I, I, I say it any old way. Sometimes we run into a funk. So there are times when the local congregation needs revival. And so this evening, permit me to speak another word from the Lord on how to get and stay in gear on the battlefield for the Lord. Now the message for your consideration this afternoon is simply entitled, Reviving the Local Church. Reviving the Local Church. By local church, I'm talking about individual congregations. Not only in this area, but across this state. Not only across this state, but across the southeastern part of the country. Not only the southeastern part of the country, but the entire country. Not only the entire country, but the entire world. Local congregations need to be revived. And so I want to talk about reviving the local church. Now I got this church in mind when I divine this message. Because I heard about the theme. And I said, oh, they want to talk about reviving the church. So let me talk about reviving Second Avenue. Now, some of you aren't here from Second Avenue, so I'm talking about reviving you too. Now, just in case you don't think you need this, I, I want you to listen anyway. I I'm reminded of that old song from the Wicked Picket. Y'all, some of y'all know that. Now, 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 if you don't like it, don't knock it. Some other church might want to rock it. Huh? If you don't need it, don't waste it. Some other church might want to taste it. So we're talking about reviving the local church. And let's begin our journey by going into the Old Testament book of First Chronicles, chapter 29 and verse number 10. Here's where we extract or extract our first point for this afternoon. The Bible says in 1 Chronicles 29 and verse 10, Therefore David blessed the Lord before all of the assembly. Here's the first thing. If we're going to revive the local church, we must revive our praise. We must revive our praise. And when we talk about the word praise, we got to understand what we're talking about. The word literally means kneeling down as an act of adoration. Sometimes you read the Old Testament and you'll find where David lay prostrate before the throne of God. The idea of prostration is laying yourself out and putting your head down to the ground because you're just not worthy enough to look at them. So you got to put your head down to the dirt that you came from and recognize God for how glorious and powerful he is. That's the idea of praise. We have to understand that the word praise is used particularly in three ways. Uh, 
religious world and they think about getting that religious high. They think about that euphoria, that sense where they get all caught up and it makes them just twist and jerk and gyrate and do all these types of things. Well, that's not what I'm talking about when I talk about praise. Now, you know, if that was what praise meant, then some of us were praising when we were in the club. Hello. I'm a 70s, one of these, I'm a 70s guy. Yeah. Emotion. I want 
life and we fall down and we get back up, fall down again, get back up, fall down again, get back up. When we come into the house of worship, we got a story to see because we've been out there busting off the hand, turning it right. I can see my hand, can you? I done said it now. When you do that kind of living and struggling with this Christian grace, Facing the ups and the downs, the trials, the tribulation, the stress, the worry, folk talking about you, backstabbing you, you're fighting enemies from within and from without. Then you come and you start singing, all that stuff comes out. That's praise. That's praise there. That's genuine praise. Because God wants to listen in. And he's wanting to say, oh yeah, I've been seeing how you've been struggling with my word and living out my word all week. And now here you are on the first day of the week and we're talking about some singing. And I hear you singing. I know what you're singing about because I was with you on the job when you were being frustrated. I was with you in the home when you and your wife were fighting. I was with you in the home when your children went to the local hotel. I'm not talking about the rich in. I was with you when you were going to physical sickness. I was with you through all that struggle and pain. And now when you come together and worship and you start singing about my glory, I know you're real about it. This is reviving our praise. You sing great singing doesn't do anything if it doesn't change your lifestyle. And so when we sing, I want our lives to sing louder than our voices. That's what it's all about. We need to revive our praise. Let's remember that any praise we give to the Lord is only as worthy as the condition of our hearts before the Lord. Let me get some Bible with that. First Chronicles chapter number 28, verses 9 and 10. Listen to David ask for you, my son Solomon. Know the Lord your father, yet to serve him with a loyal heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and understands all the intent of the thoughts. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. What is the point? The general meaning of loyal in that text is entering into a state of wholeness and unity of a restored relationship. Said in another way that when we are walking hand in hand with God and we stop giving him praise, it'll be genuine praise because when the heart is right, then the praise is right, even if you miss a few notes. I'd much rather hear somebody miss a note in a song than miss a note in their lifestyle. Can I say it again? Yeah. I think I said something. Yeah. You get here and hit some foul notes, that's okay. Right. But don't let me come find out you hit a foul note on Friday night on. at 11.45. Yeah. <laughs> we missed the good part. And Mrs. Sweet Cheeks, when they came over at 10, they said to watch the news. And the TV never came on. But instead, Teddy was on, singing his stuff. Turn out lights, light a candle. I want to give you something so sweet. Oh Lord, I need some help up in here. When he starts singing, take him off. And you giving up the fruit in your looms.
and he began to pray. And he dedicated the temple. And he was in that prayer emphasizing the purpose of the house of God. And if you and I are going to revive the local church, we got to revive our purpose. we got to remember that the church is the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus called it. He said, upon this rock, I'll build my church. And he goes on to say, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom. So the church is the kingdom of God. It is the community of Christ. It is the realm of the redeemed, the saved, and the sanctified. And we are added to it in obedience to the gospel. But the church must remember her purpose. Church is not a building. Let me say it again. Church is not a building. Let me say it one more time. Church is not a building. Better say it again, can't count. The church is not a building. No, the building keeps the rain from falling on our head. The building keeps us warm in the winter and cool in the summer. The building keeps something cushioning on our posterior ear. The building keeps us from the elements and gives us light at night, but the church is not the building. Church is not the sorority or the fraternity. You don't run things on a vote based on whoever paid their dues. You don't have the AKA corner. Some of you know what I'm talking about. You don't have a Delta corner. It's not a fraternity. You don't have a Kappa corner. Oh no, it's not a fraternity, nor a sorority. It's not a funeral. Some folks think the church is the funeral. And I can't blame some of them because that's how sometimes some we act. That's how we act sometimes. But the church is not the funeral home. The church is not the community center. Woo, I'm coming back to that one. The church is not the concert hall. It is not the place for winner, winner, chicken dinner. It's not what the church is. It is God's kingdom on earth. And it must follow God's agenda. And so if we're going to revive the local church, we need to revive and refocus on our purpose. Well, what is the purpose of the church? The purpose of the local church is to be Jesus to that community. Oh, I said a lot again. I said a lot again. The purpose of the local church is to be Jesus in the community. It means to be Jesus in the community. And what did Jesus do in the community? Jesus reached after those who were lost. That's the purpose of the church. You need to know and I need to remember. We need to realize that the most of the souls that are won are won before they ever get into the building. Oh, you missed it. Acts chapter number 8. Here's Philip going about his business. Spirit said, there's a man over there in a chariot. Run over there to that chariot. Philip didn't run to a church building. He ran to the chariot. The man was in there reading Ezekiel the prophet, Isaiah the prophet, rather. And Philip taught that man Jesus and put him in the water. Most of the people won for Christ or won before they get in here. They won in the family reunion. Where it's nice and comfortable. And folk are talking about all kinds of stuff. And you get a chance to slip a word in about Jesus. And you get a chance to pull them over in the corner. You get them out of the cooler that nobody should be in. And you take them in the kitchen. And you teach them about Jesus. And then you can bring them to the building. And put them in the water. Most of the people that are one are one before they get in the building. This is why Jesus tells us to go out and be fishers of men. We don't catch fish in the refrigerator. And if we do, they're already dead. We have to understand that our job, our purpose of the local church is to be Jesus to the community. That means get them out of this building. Get out the building. We can't do like the monks and the nuns and the 
vaccines back in the day. They stayed up in the in the building, huddled among themselves. The people around some drive up. Oh, there goes brother so I guess. And then they see him drive away. But there's never any touch to the folk that are in the community. Let me be nosy. I'm a metal. I ain't looking for a home. I can metal. I always thought that this is a perfect spot for a congregation. You got community all around. You see little kids running up and down. Older folk running all around. Some sitting on the floor. And some of us, we, we do like that, that, that story of a good Samaritan. We see them sitting on the porch. And we come going down the road. Oh, be in church. Then we park and we come in. And we get our worship on. And we go out and see him again. You should have been in church. And drive on down the road. Nobody ever parked the car. Walked up and said, hey, you know, I was wondering, have you ever thought about God? Have you ever thought about the things of God? Are you interested in the things of God? You know, well, I would love to have a Bible class with you. And if they got little children, come on, give me these little crumb crutches. We got a little program going on that will help them learn something about the Bible. That's getting into the community. That's being Jesus to the community. There's a fire. A building gets burned down. And we come over there and say, you know what? Anybody got like hurt? Any, any, do you need anything? Did you have insurance? We want to help. Who are you? Oh, we, we belong to St. Avenue. We belong to St. Avenue. And, and, and we just want to get out here and help. Because that's what Jesus would do. He would help. He would help you with this. Are you, am I making any sense here? We got to get out of the building. And into the community. If we are going to revive our purpose, we must remember our purpose is not simply to come here and sing. Our purpose is to be engaged in the community. Around you making folk man and he and Lewis Brown. I make a man in her Vegas too. That's just the way it is. Now, if you don't like it, don't knock it. Somebody else might want to rock it. You don't need it. Don't waste it. Somebody else might want to taste it. We look around at some of these other churches that are popping up and blowing up all over the area. Amen. And we say, man, how are they blowing up like this? Well, a lot of them have their finger on the pulse of the neighborhood. And they've been checking the neighborhood out. And they've done demographic studies. And they've learned what people need. And they've gone to help with folk that need it. Around the teaching folks. I'm not talking about what they're teaching. I'm talking about what they're doing. Look, folks, hear this camp. Not everything other groups do is wrong. No. Not everything no. is wrong. You have a fire in your house. Lose everything. And some XYZ group comes down to your door. Hello? Hi. You need something? Uh, I could use something. Well, here's what we do. We have a fund for furnishing people who lost their furnishing. We like to give it to you. I bet you none of you. None of you. But look at that. No, I don't take that kind of money. If it's green, it's spin. That's getting into the community. I ain't trying to get you bit, but I am getting in your business. You can do a whole lot wherever your local congregation is by stepping into the community and finding out what people need and getting there to help when you can. Well, Brown, they might rip us off. Yeah, I know some folk rip you off, but you got some of your own members ripping you off. Somebody 
somebody using you. Use wisdom, but get out there and help. Which leads to my last thing this afternoon. Y'all all right? Got one more to drop. Don't get out of town. I ain't getting out of town because I'm scared. I'll be right back. But, but I got to go change clothes. If we are going to revive the local church, we need to revive our program. Hold on to your seats here. It's going to get rough. We need to revive our program. I've been observing controversies among the brotherhood the past few several years. I've been seeing congregations struggle and wrestle and some even split. And usually it's because somebody didn't understand that our programs cannot remain static. Reviving the church requires a willingness to change our programs. Years ago, I used to watch that show with uh, Lisa Bonet. Lisa for a little while, then they kicked her off. It's a different world from where you come from. I put a blog out not too long ago because this stuff was on my mind. And the blog was entitled, is entitled, This Ain't Your Daddy's Church. And what I was getting at was we need to be willing to freshen our program. If we're going to revive the church. Let me give you a secret. Not everybody who leaves a local congregation is leaving because they hate the Bible. In fact, most folk who leave is not because they hate the Bible. They got a problem with antiquated programs. I'm not talking about changing the word. You can't change the word. Thy word is forever stench. The word of God will last forever. Nobody's talking about changing the word. Nobody's talking about changing the message. But we're talking about the program. How we execute our ministry. Now, I don't like change. Well, I, 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 let me challenge that. Cars change. I bet you get a different one if you can avoid it. Cars change, but the basic idea of the car is the same. It gets you from one place to another. I'm standing out on the porch and one of these good Christians came teasing with me and said, what you driving now? You know, I've been known to switch it up. I just say, y'all all right? Y'all got time for this? Uh, uh, about eight years, nine years ago, I decided that I never had a conversion. I went down to the dealership, saw this beautiful, beautiful crossfire, drop top, two-tone seats. I looked at that thing. Liked it a lot. Right. Who am I kidding? I love it. <laughs> I took it for a test drive and I said, all right, what is it? They told me to ditch it and I paid for it.
Well, you don't like that one? Let me try another one. <laughs> Clothes change. But they still should function to cover your nakedness. That all right? I used to love the pale bottom pants. And then the flare bottom pants. And the platform shoes. I used to love that. Helped you with the women, you see. All of a sudden, you're being tall. As long as they don't see you the next day. Without those shoes on. Oh, so when you laughing at us, you get us with the hair. Oh, I do some help with you. But you know, those kind of clothes have moved on. Clothes change. But the design of the clothes changing shouldn't stop you from wearing clothes. Because the design of the clothes is still the cover your. I guess I better move on. <laughs> Almost slipped. Well, all right, let's get on in here. <laughs> Televisions change. Y'all remember the little nine-inch ones? Yeah. And then you got the, what, the 19. Ooh. Then it went to 25. Somebody came out with a 32-inch. And then it came out 50-inch and 55. I saw one the other day, 82! Yeah. But it just notices one thing for me. They're still designed to just show me the program. Right. Over the screen. I think you see the point. These things change, but they still have the same focus. I'm telling you that the church's way of doing its ministry may change, but as long as the message doesn't change, it's all right. You can't have the ministry running the same way it ran in 1940. Am I making any connection here? There were things that were done in 1940 that don't work today. I talk to my mom sometimes, uh, all the time, brother, but I talk to her about this sometimes. We have a good time talking. My mother's been blessed to be 86 years old, still driving her own car, still walking around, still doing all the cooking, still doing all that stuff. Mm. Lord is blessing her. And she reminds me of the days of the three-week tent meetings. Now, I wasn't in that day. I wasn't a part of that. But they tell me about it, and I've heard that they, sometimes they go on longer than that. She told me about a preacher who came and did a three-week meeting and got mad because they weren't having Seven days a week work for some folk. And air conditioning in the house. And all that other stuff. That doesn't mean that it wasn't effective then. It's just something you got to ask yourself. Is it effective today? 90 something degrees outside. You going to have a technique. Am I making any sense here? Oh, we need to have a technique because that's what they used to do. This ain't so dirty, sir. They had a tent meeting. Now, I forgot around the corner, too, not too far from here. It was a big thing. I think the first night, it was like 700 people. All the churches in the area. And then the next night, as far as I can remember, or the next year, one way or the other, I remember it had rained. And we still having the meeting. And folk came out, I remember, in the mud. And my shoes, what y'all doing? And I remember sitting there, mosquitoes all over the place. And then I heard Come to Hunts Vegas telling me about a tent meeting. I'll, I'll pray for you. <laughs> because if I can be in some air conditioning and the rain not falling on my head and mosquitoes away from me, I'm, which line you going to get in? <laughs> I'm getting in the line with the comfort. Nothing wrong with the meeting, but remember the world changes. Styles change. Fashions change. Televisions change. Medical procedures change. Changes, but the one thing that doesn't change is the word of God. Amen. And yet we can change the program of how 
how we act as the people of God. Let me give you a little bit of an example. Let me have my seat. You see, the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 2 that the church was established on earth. The Bible tells us that there were all kinds of folk. Over 3,000 souls were baptized at that church. And then the Bible went on to say another 5,000 were baptized into the church. And then the Bible said it was multitudes, all kinds of people. By the time you pull up in Acts chapter 6, there's a problem in the church. There's a problem with the style of ministry. Well, how do you know it's a problem with the style of ministry? I know it's a problem in the style of ministry because the Bible makes it quite plain. Brown, what you doing? You packing up and run? No, I'm not scared of anybody. I'm packing up so I can finish down on the floor. I want to show you what happened. Here in Acts chapter 6, they got to the point where there were some widows there, and these widows said, we're not getting our fair share of the daily administration. And they came to the apostles with that stuff, and, and, and the apostles said, hey, look, we ain't got time for this. We don't have time. Evidently, they used to have time to look over that stuff. But then they said, we don't have time to look after all this stuff. You choose some folk who we will put over that stuff and let them handle it. All right, all right, all right. Now, 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 I hope you called it. That was a change in the program. That was a change in the program. Because the old program wasn't working anymore. You don't like that one? I got another one for you. Back in the Old Testament. Moses is listening to all these people coming to him. He had the whole church come running one, one man. This problem, that problem, this problem, the other problem. Jethro said, are you crazy? These folks are going to drive you nuts. You pick somebody else, some other men, and they'll listen and they'll listen and they'll listen and the tough stuff comes to you. Now, I don't know if you call it, but that's a change in the program. What we got to do in local church sometimes is change the program. People have controversy over sin. Ooh, it's getting touchy in here. Oh, I went down to the congregation, did a meeting up in Richmond, Virginia. And there's a new church plan. I went there, a good friend of mine, went and preached there. But before I got up to preach, man, they were singing. And let me tell you, they were lifting the roof off the place. That was different from the way I was used to doing it. Because four guys stepped up there. And one was leading the course, and then the other guys filled in, and the way they, they never missed a beat. One guy finished singing his part, his verse, and then he would step to the back, never drop a stop. And then the next guy would be stepping up to the mic, and he'd pick it up just like that, and then he'd turn around, and they go on, and it just kept going. And I said, whoo, <laughs> y'all got this thing going. And they weren't trying to be the temptations. They weren't stepping like the stylistics. They weren't trying to be the Manhattans. They were just changing the style. But nobody had a piano. Nobody had a, a, a harmonica. Nobody played any drums. Nobody did any of that stuff. And why were they doing that? Because their church building sits right next to a campus. And that campus has a lot of young people. And they decided the best way for us to try to get them to hear the message is to get them at least to come in the door. And they knew those kids weren't coming in here in the 1930s style. So we got to change the style so that we can help give at least a chance to pass on the message. Am I making any sense here at all? Oh, are you over the wrong stuff? We get all caught up. I, I went to a church in California. I, I'll be done in just a minute. And stop saying the devil's a lie. I went to a church in California. And I was in that church, and I sat down, and the people started coming in. And when I came in the door, I saw a bunch of surfboards on the wall in the foyer. Okay, what do I do? I guess. I had my seat. Preacher got up, and uh, he, he, he sat down uh, on the stair, on the, on the steps up. He was sitting there, waiting for people to come in. And then I saw him pull off his tie, took his jacket off, short sleeve. He just started preaching. I'm like, okay, okay. And I looked around, I saw these dudes up there with some shorts. It's California, y'all. And some tank tops. And I'm in there suited and booted. I don't know what y'all doing. But then it kept dawning on me, you in California, fool. It's 90 something degrees out there. These folk are in here worshiping. Nobody was acting silly. I heard the same message that I preached. I heard acapella singing. We had to communion. We had to 
because of what they're doing. Because this is their area and they're trying to fit in their community. I understand it. Now, here's the difference. Here's the difference. I went to visit a church in Virginia. A different church in Virginia. Richmond, Virginia. And when I went in there, I had my seat. And when I had my seat, I was worshiping, trying to, but things was saying my spider senses were tingling. <laughs> they came to the communion, and I noticed a sister got up. I was kind of like, okay. And I thought there were some doors like this. I thought she was getting up to go out and pick something up. She got up in the table. Whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Got to the preaching part. Uh, came to the scripture reading. So she got up again. So maybe she's going to fix the curtain. So I don't know. And she went on and read the scripture. Now, women, I love you. But women don't lead the church. In accordance to the scriptures. Oh, boy, I got to hear him finish this. I got to finish this. I got to finish this. So in that situation, I said, something wrong here. And I got on out of there. I went to a church in Atlanta. And I got in there and sat down and big crowd. And I'm okay, this is going to be cool. And as I looked up on the stage, I saw a big guitar is too, too small. One of those big, I'm going to say a big violin. How's that? I saw a piano. I saw that. I said, wait a minute. I was just running my mind, well, where am I? I looked inside and said, Church of Christ. But I got in and I saw something that's just outside of the bounds of what I see in the book. Now that's different. I'm not saying change the program, bring in instruments. That's not what I'm talking about. Change the program, let the women lead. That's not what I'm talking about. Change the program, uh, have, have, have a ham, hock, and potato salad on the table. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the program in the sense of how you do your ministry. Can I give you one more example? Enough trouble, I might as well be in some more. Now, Westview is 10 years old. I started Westview just before I left here. And now we've been gone for 10 years. Lord has blessed us to go from 7 to 70. All right. I'm very pleased about that. Right. Last year we moved into a new building. It's still real, but it's, 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 it's the first place was 1,000 square feet. This was 5,000 square feet. Right. We needed the room. Got little rug rats running all over the place. Having a good time with them. I'm the old man now. Congregation is my uh, primarily 40 and under. I'm the old, I'm the old head, along with a handful of other ones. And I'm happy to see that. Because I got two assistant ministers, one's 40, the other one's in the 30s, and somehow or another, as time goes on and I keep running, I'm going to do this. I'm past my time. Because I got some more trips to take. to with that is, in terms of our finances, we got two sisters who manage the money. Now they don't tell me what to do with it. But they let me know what, not, what, might, what might not be wise to do. Because we might break the bank. Am I making any sense in here? These two girls, I shouldn't call them girls, they're two women, young women, both of them work in accounting. Yeah. I don't know nothing about accounting. Why should I be there trying to struggle over trying to add up and do debits and all that? I don't know that stuff. You ask me about account receivable, I think I'm about to receive some money. I don't know that stuff. But they know that stuff. That's their job. And so rather than get fussing and fighting over whether the Bible says the women can keep the books which the Bible doesn't address. All right. All right. It just made sense to me to say, y'all make sure we don't blow this money here. And you let me know when I come up with an idea and we don't have budget for it. Give me some reports. Let me know what's happening. 
and I'll be ears open when you come and say, uh, Doc, that's okay, that's a nice idea. But you know, if we do that, we're going to have to spin out of this, and you may not want to do this because you said you wanted that money for this. All right, all right. You know what I said? Thank you. Praise the Lord. Right. We'll do a different thing. If you've gotten anything, I hope you've gotten the fact that I'm never talking about changing the Word of God. I'm talking about changing the program because sometimes the program is too old and ineffective. Now, if it's old and effective, don't worry about it. If it's old and effective, leave it alone. But if it's old and it's not effective, reevaluate it. Because it might be a thing to change. we got to learn the difference between what God says in his word and what our preferences are. I prefer a whole lot of things that God didn't care about. Some of you may prefer red seats in here. That's your preference. But if the leadership is so deemed that well, we're going to keep the seats blue, you got to win me your own soul. Oh, I'm out. between your personal preference and what God says in his word. Now, I'm going to get this one, Tina, and have a seat, promise you. When you run into these controversial issues about singing, about how to do your particular programs, your order of worship, your time of worship, stuff like that, and you got folk who are used to one thing and folk want another thing, let love rule the day. You see, my preference is not so important that I'm a split the church. Uh, it doesn't mean that much to me. If my preference is one thing and yours is another and you feel so strongly about it that you're going to walk away from Jesus. Oh man, I'll give mine up. It don't mean, mean that much to me. Hey, look, if you got to have the old-fashioned cups with somebody pour the juice in and you don't like these things like this, then, and you're going you gonna to tear up the church over it? Alright, so bring the Welch's grape juice and pour it. I don't care. I much rather have ease than more sanitary. But if you've got to have the other one, you want to lose your soul over that. You want to have a big one, you're going to see the Lord Lord coming. <laughs> then we'll just keep going. Let love rule the day. What's most important is that we draw closer to the Lord. Can I tell you something? I won't even introduce things to Westview that I think are fine, but I know would upset too many folk. I won't introduce them. Brown, you, you, you punk? No! <laughs> Your soul is more important to me. Don't mean that much to me. I'll just let it go. And in some cases, you gotta wait for some folk to just decide they're gonna do something else. Or the Lord called him. <laughs> but I'm not doing something just to be doing it. I hope this is making sense. So even here, when you have controversies about stuff, let love rule the day. Paul said in Romans chapter 14, don't do anything that makes your brother stumble. Well, I like it this way. I'm a big dog in town, and I want it this way. You're going to be the big dog in hell. <laughs> running folk away over something that you ought to be able to have loud well, enough to say, okay, we're just going to let this thing go because it really doesn't matter. Use wisdom. When you want to change something that's really just plain broke, sometimes you may just have to change that. You got a brother counting money, thank God they never had this at, at, at Lewisburg, as long as I know. Uh, but you got a brother counting money and it's always coming up short some kind of way. But you got him in there, oh, he's been in there a long time, his daddy used to do it, and, and, and we want to break his heart, we got to keep this in. We don't want to hurt his feelings, but you got to you want to hurt his feelings. <laughs> Look, brother, we love you, but you, you simply not, you can't count. You can't count. We got to do something different here. Now, we love you. We'll let you write down the number on the board. Trying to get an exciting praise and there's no lifestyle behind it. In fact, if folk are only concerned.
concerned about making a whole lot of noise and doing a whole lot of screaming, but they don't live right, then that, that, that's not praising anyway. Yeah. Only one that's praising is the devil himself. In there, here, and I'll say, oh, we sing it, we get it on, we get it on. And he watching us act the fruit the rest of the week. <laughs> revive genuine praise. And then, if we want to revive the local church, remember your mission. Remember your mission. Your mission is not to make people in here feel good. Your mission is to win the loss to Christ. And that ought to make people feel good. And then, revive your program. Evaluate your program every now and again. You find something that you're doing that's just not working. Not working? Then you ought to be willing to change it. I'm voting for Toronto. <laughs> Brother Curtis, I want to win. I'm tired of voting state. Every time they get to the end of a quarter, you know what the job of Nick Nurse is? All right, Curry is spotting over here too fast. Nobody's covering him. And then we got Durant, who may be coming back the next game, so if we don't shut this down here, we're going to have a problem there. So let's make some adjustments. And then the other team re readjust to that. Come the third quarter, all right? We got them on that, but they caught up on us. Let's go this way. Let's make some adjustments. Get to the fourth quarter, all right, they caught with that, now we got to make some more adjustments. You know what I'm telling the local church? Make some adjustments. Make some adjustments. If the community changes and it becomes, for example, majority of, of, of Spanish-speaking people, I'm just using an example, then you might start thinking, either we got to learn some Spanish or we better open up some kind of way to communicate the gospel to them. You may have to look for a brother who come in and speak some Spanish to communicate the gospel. That's changing the program. Does it make sense? Big Ali fan here. Watch the Ali fight so many fights. Watch the old ones too. I know this is some of his toughest fights. What he had to do was learn to change his strategy. He get out there. He fought against George Foreman. He did the rope dope. He wrote that dope and fought. Uh, 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 and finally, Ali looked down and knew it was time. Ernie Shavers. And Ernie Shavers, when Ali did the rope a Shavers just walked away and said, you come ahead and sit in the ring. And Ali had to change his strategy right quick or Shavers would have knocked him out. What am I telling you, local church? Change your strategy as you need to. If you're here today, you're not a member of the Lord's church, or they're not sitting down giving you the invitation. I've been talking about the church because this is the body of same people. These are the people that Christ died for. These are the people that Christ is coming back for. And you become part of that people by simply believing that he is the Son of God, turning your mind in repentance to accept his ways, confessing him as the Son of God and being buried in water that we have in the back. We have the change of the clothes in the back. We have everything we need and you need in the back. And when you're baptized for the remission of your sins, you are automatically added to the church. You have the Holy Spirit. Be faithful unto death and he'll give you a crown of life. The message is yours. The invitation is yours. Stand together with me now. Let's sing a verse of a song of encouragement. Jesus rose with all power in his hand.
do Lord, when I found you It was plain to see You were my destiny 